want to welcome those of you in Prince William, Montgomery County, Loudoun, Arlington, here in the room. Give it up, Arlington. Although we are looking forward to you not being here, <laughs> with all due respect. And I think you are too, uh, as we build out that Arlington location. There are 1,189 chapters in the Bible. And one of them describes love more than any other chapter. And it just so happens that God has planned, like the schedule was a long time ago, God has planned for us to be in that one chapter today. Before we even open the Bible, I just want you to feel the wonder of that reality right where you are sitting. And some of you are visiting with us today from another church, or maybe you're exploring Christianity. And you're gonna hear today about a vote we're having as a church, but far more important than that, especially if you're exploring Christianity, I believe with all my heart that God has planned for you to be here today to hear about a love that is totally otherworldly. And for those of you who are from another church or a part of this church family, I believe God has a clear word for us today in this local church and in the broader church in order to make sure you know it's not my word but straight from him, I'm gonna do something a little bit different but I wanna pray before we open his word on all of our behalf. So would you bow your heads with me? Oh God, before we open your word, we pause to thank you for your love for each of us. Thank you for sending Jesus to die on a cross for our sins and to rise from the grave. So through faith in him, we might have a relationship with you as your children. So as your children, as brothers and sisters in your family, we pray that you would help us together to hear your word now. To hear it, to receive it, and to act according to it. And we ask God that you would move supernaturally by your spirit through your word in our hearts each of our hearts and in the heart of our church in the next few minutes. In Jesus' name we pray and all God's people said together, amen, amen. amen. Now, if you have a Bible, and I hope you or somebody around you does that you can look on with, let me invite you to open with me to 1 Corinthians chapter 13. And while you're turning, I, I do want to ask those of you who are exploring Christianity or you're from another church to bear with me for a couple of minutes here at the start as I speak specifically to our church family here, for members of this church specifically. God has done a lot in my heart in this week of prayer and fasting together and in spending time with many people from many perspectives. And we need to realize there are two things happening right now. One thing is happening specifically today, but there's a second, much bigger, much broader, and in a sense, much more significant thing that is happening during these days. So let me explain about what I mean. First, specifically today, near the end of our worship gathering, we're gonna vote on potential new elders. I've shared before that this is one of the most important things we do as a church, affirming elders who will lead the church to follow Jesus. This is absolutely an act of worship before God. And every summer, our church sets aside time before God to affirm men who will love and lead this church according to his word. 
And three brothers from this church family have been nominated to serve in this way. All three of them recommended by members of this church family at different locations. A team of men and women in our church interviewed them, examined their lives and doctrine, and unanimously affirmed all three of them to our current elders. Then our current elders did the same, interviewed and examined their lives and doctrine, and have now unanimously recommended them to serve our church. And we've asked for anyone to contact us with any concerns about these men, and no one has expressed any concerns about any of them to us. To be clear, these are not yes men or men with any agenda other than to follow Jesus as leaders in the church. Any suggestion otherwise means you don't know these men. Jim Burris, Ken Tucker, Chuck Hollingsworth, all three of these brother, brothers, by God's grace, walk with God. Love this church family, have humbly served for collective decades here. And really us affirming them as elders is more a matter of acknowledging what they're already doing. They're already teaching God's word, shepherding people's hearts, helping broken marriages heal. These men, by God's grace, are gifts he has given to this church. And I've heard some people say, well, I think these men are biblically qualified, but I wanna see this or that change in the church, so I'm gonna vote no. But that's basically saying you don't trust these men to follow Jesus and do what's best for his church. So to be clear, that's the question before us, before God, together to say in each of our lives, either one, we affirm these men as biblically qualified to lead us to follow Jesus, or we say these men are not biblically qualified to lead us to follow Jesus. So that's the specific thing that's happening in our worship gatherings today. And some have asked, are we rushing this vote? Or what about questions I have about this or that in the church, about important things like race or politics or ministries or programs or any number of other things? And the answer is no, we're definitely not rushing. We're actually required every year at this time to affirm at least two elders. Last summer we weren't able to meet because of COVID, so we're affirming three today. And all three of these men have been through a process over months and in some cases years to get to this point. The challenge is, and this is where good questions about race or politics or many other really important things come in. And this is where I wanna clarify the two things that are happening right now because we're voting on elders today during days that have been extremely tumultuous. And by days, I mean the last year in which we have experienced unique challenges unlike many, arguably most, of us have ever experienced in the world. Challenges that have created all kinds of tensions in our lives, our families, in our country, in the world, and in the church. And we need to separate that out to see it for what it is. One thing that's happening today is deciding before God if three elders will lead us to follow Jesus. But separate from that, a, bi a bigger, broader thing is happening during these days. And we need to name that clearly. During these days, coming out of this last year, out of this last week, into the next week, and into the next year, we are deciding how we are going to relate to one another in a world of tension. We've seen over the last year in the broader church and in this local church, and we've seen it come to head over recent weeks here, unprecedented division and tension and disagreement, not just in the world, but between brothers and sisters in Christ some of whom have shared friendships for decades. And those friendships, even some family relationships, have been strained, in some cases torn apart, in ways that are clearly not from God. So let's name it for what it is. There is an adversary attacking the one thing Jesus prayed for us before he died. 
that Carol Shriver, who's faithfully taught God's word here for years, was right where I'm standing. Actually, she was kneeling here Friday night praying in tears that we may be one even as Jesus and the Father are one so that the world might know the love of God. By this will all people know that we are disciples of Jesus, by our love for one another. And that, so let's name it, that love for one another is what is under attack in all of our hearts during these days. There is an adversary who's been wreaking havoc in marriages, in families, in the church broadly speaking, and in this local church over the last year, over the last month, over the last week, and it is no coincidence in the sovereign design of God that on this day when we gather together for us to hear from God to all of us these words, and I just want to read them on his behalf. This is the voice of God speaking to us right now. If I speak in the tongues of men and of angels, but have not love, I am a noisy gong or a clanging cymbal. And if I have prophetic powers and understand all mysteries and all knowledge, and if I have all faith so as to remove mountains, but have not love, I am nothing. If I give away all I have, and if I deliver up my body to be burned, but have not love, I gain nothing. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. Love never ends. As for prophecies, they will pass away. As for tongues, they will cease. As for knowledge, it will pass away. For we know in part and we prophesy in part, but when the perfect comes, the partial will pass away. When I was a child, I spoke like a child. I thought like a child. I reasoned like a child. When I became a man, I gave up childish ways. For now we see in a mirror dimly, but then face to face. Now I know in part, then I shall know fully, even as I have been fully known. So now faith, hope, and love abide, these three. But the greatest of these is love. So let's be clear. Yes, the specific question we're answering today is, will these three men lead us to follow Jesus? But in a much, much bigger way during these days, the significant question we must answer together is how are we going to love one another? In this local church and among Christians and the broader church as a whole, and God is speaking a word loud and clear to any heart that is willing to hear. God is saying to us during these days, if, if you speak in tongues like angels, but you don't have love for each other, you, you're just a noisy gong. If you prophesy with power, if you have faith that moves mountains, but you don't have love, you are nothing. You can give away everything you have. You can lose your life, but if you don't have love for others, it's worthless. Do we hear what God is saying to us? We are nothing, you see it twice. We are nothing in our lives without love for others no matter what we say or do. Now, it's not that those other things aren't good. Prophesying, speaking, faith, generously giving, laying down your life, 
Those are all good things, but they're only good when they're done in the context of love. Which is why when the Bible goes back to spiritual gifts at the beginning of chapter 14, verse one, notice the first two words. God says, pursue love and earnestly desire the spiritual gifts. Pursue love. And not love according to the world's definition of love or according to your or my definition of love, what you or I think or feel is loving. Let's be honest, we can all get caught up in thinking, what I'm doing is loving, what I'm posting is loving, the way I'm speaking is loving, or every single means may not be loving, but the end is loving. But we need to stop and ask, is that what God says about love? I mean, just think about what he says clearly after getting on the floor to wash his disciples' feet. Jesus says in John 13, 34, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. By this, all people will know you're my disciples. If you have a love like this for one another, what is, what is this kind of love? It's the kind of love that stoops to serve others in the most menial way imaginable. 1 Peter 4, 8. Above all, keep loving one another since love covers a multitude of sins. Love is covering a multitude of sins. Romans 12, 10. Love one another with brotherly affection. Outdo one another in showing honor. Love is outdoing others in honoring them. Ephesians chapter 4. Verse one and two, I urge you to walk in a manner worthy of the calling to which you've been called with all humility and gentleness, with patience, bearing with one another in love. Love is humbly, gently, patiently bearing with each other. One translation of this verse says, putting up with each other's faults. It's interesting, you come back to 1 Corinthians 13 here, I'm guessing individual Christians at Corinth would have said, I'm loving of course I am. But when you look at the way love, God describes love in verses four through seven here, you start to realize this is actually not just a random list of characteristics. This is a specific rebuke of a lack of love among the Christians at Corinth. We've seen this. They were being impatient and unkind toward each other, even in the Lord's Supper, 1 Corinthians 11. They were filled with envy for each other. We've seen language of boasting, being puffed up and proud in their own positions or boasting in different leaders, dividing into different camps, 1 Corinthians 1 through 3. Taking each other to court, 1 Corinthians chapter 6, insisting on their own way, even if it caused others to stumble, 1 Corinthians chapter 8. Tolerating wrongdoing, 1 Corinthians chapter 5. God says, what you are doing is not love. Here's what real love looks like. If I could just be vulnerable, I had a whole other sermon written out to preach from this point. From this text, talking about all kinds of issues in the church. And I'd have, I could have slept a lot more last night if I'd have stuck with it. But something happened yesterday. Heather's out for a friend's birthday, so I had the kids, and we went to one of our local outreach festivals in a part of our city where there's a lot of crime and drugs and hurt and pain. And I was out there sweating with brothers and sisters from this church family, people playing games, singing songs, sharing the gospel. One member of this church who's ethnically Chinese learned Spanish over COVID this last year by going to outreaches and sharing the gospel and has now led many people to faith in Christ in Spanish. And I thought, this is who we are. This is who the church is. And specifically in the city, this is who NBC is. People who love God with all our hearts and we love others 
like we've been loved by him. Like that's what I want to be a part of. And I think it's what we all want to be a part of. Yet we are living in a world and days where an adversary is, doesn't want that to happen, is trying to rip us apart in ways I trust we realize are not good for the reputation of Jesus or his church. What's happening is not good for us, not bringing glory to him before a watching world. And I've been wrestling in this week of prayer and fasting in my own heart, like, God, how am I contributing to this? It's been so humbling. And this week of fasting and praying through this text and other parts of God's word as his spirit has exposed areas of my life and leadership that are not loving As I've wrestled and agonized over how to shepherd and love you and glorify him in a world with so much tension in so many different directions. For one person, it's here. For another person, it's there. Another person, it's there. Like, God, how to shepherd in the middle of all of this. And last night, as I was praying after yesterday, I just sensed, as best as I can discern, God saying, Simply let my word and my spirit do my work in the hearts of my people. And that's why I want to do something a little different because I so want you to walk away from today saying, we did not hear from David, we heard from God. Like I want you to be able to say that every week regardless of who's, who's preaching, but especially on this day, especially during these days, so here's what we're going to do. We're going to memorize 1 Corinthians 13, 4 through 7 together. That's what we're going to do. It's a few short verses, but I am believing that if we together could just stamp these words deep on our hearts, it would change everything. His word has power to do that kind of work. I'm believing that. So that's, that's what we're going to do. I want to lead us to memorize this. I'll offer a sh few short words of explanation or application along the way, particularly as God has been applying this text to my heart in ways that I hope are helpful for your heart. And if you're not a Christian, we invite you to memorize with us. You can tell your friends. You've actually memorized part of the Bible. So here's how it's going to work. I'm going to say a few words out loud. Then you repeat after me. I won't have them on the screen while we're reciting, and you can't look down. No cheating. That would not be loving. loving love does not rejoice in wrongdoing. So, all right, here we go. You ready? 1 Corinthians chapter 13, verse 4. First three words, love is patient. So let's repeat that out loud with me. Love is patient. Say it one more time. Love is patient. All right, we're off to a good start. Patient. Patient. Let's just kind of take this step by step. Love is patient. Love doesn't jump to conclusions or assumptions. It's not quick to accuse. Love doesn't, love doesn't pop off on text or email, or social media, or in person. Love is patient with each other and kind to each other. Let's say that with me. Love is patient and kind. One more time. Love is patient and kind. Let's just let that soak in. Are our words to others always kind? Maybe a deeper question. Are our words about others always kind? Do we assume the best about others? Or do we assume the worst about them? For those of you who were here on Friday night in our time of repenting and praying, Mike apologized for an unhelpful hurtful phrase that he had used in an interview a year ago that popped up on social media this week. 
And I know he'll explain more at some point. And I appreciated his humility. But I also grieved over how he had shared that phrase in the context of honestly expressing his own hurts and struggles. And that social media post this week had totally ignored that and immediately assumed the absolute worst about Mike. I know I don't like my words being taken out of context. And I know I've taken others' words out of context. God, help us to be kind with our words, our thoughts, even that which no one else sees but God. To believe the best, not the worst, about others. And to look for opportunities to give a kind word to others or about others. Wouldn't this alone change everything? If we just did this? Like, don't ever underestimate the value of a kind word. I think about Jimmy Mitchell, who many of you know served as an elder in this church for decades and led this church through tumultuous trying times in the past alongside Lon. I think Jimmy has been the single most encouraging person to me since I came here. And he's done it primarily through timely, short, kind words. Especially through the last year and up to the last week saying, hang in there. The path is hard. I'm holding you up in prayer. You have the Holy Spirit in you. Keep leading this church. That's what he always ends with. Keep leading. Jimmy has no idea how his simple, kind words have served my heart. And I submit you have no idea how a simple, kind word to or about someone else will serve their heart so well. God is telling us that. Love is patient and kind. And this next part, love does not envy or boast. So we're adding envy and boast. So let's say that together. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. One more time. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. You see how pride is at the core of both of those? Envying what you don't have, boasting in what you do have. We're starting to see that the opposite of love, according to God, is not hate. It's pride. A prideful preoccupation with ourselves rearing its ugly head in envy, in boasting, in arrogance. That's what comes next. It is not arrogant or rude. Let's just say that part together. It is not arrogant or rude. One more time. It is not arrogant or rude. Let's try to put it all together. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. You are killing it. And that's a good thing for those who don't get that slang. Not arrogant. Not concerned about what's best for us and not for others. And not rude doesn't lack concern for others in what we say and do. Someone's rude, like they they were not thinking at all about anybody but themselves, the way that would hurt. I've been convicted in my own life and leadership this week that a lack of listening to others is a picture of being rude. It shows a lack of love for others. And love is not arrogant or rude. Now the next part, it does not insist on its own way. Say that with me. It does not insist on its own way. One more time. It does not insist on its own way. All together. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. 
It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. All right, hang with me, hang with me. What a, what a line. In a year where we have all had and have opinions, even convictions about what should or should not be said or done in all kinds of spheres, including the church, for God to say love does not insist on its own way. Like whose marriage in this gathering could survive if both spouses insisted on their own ways? You just try that this week and report how it goes. <laughs> the church can't survive that way either. God help each of us not to insist on our own way. And God help us not to be irritable when things don't go our way. That's what's next in this text. It's not irritable or resentful. Let's say just that part. It is not irritable or resentful. One more time. It is not irritable or resentful. You wanna try it all? All right, here we go. It was like a weak yes. So here we go, you got this, you got this. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. <laughs> so great. Just watching someone. It does, uh, yeah. <laughs> You're doing good. You're doing good. It's not irritable or resentful. Many translations say, love keeps no record of wrongs or offenses. Love isn't ready to always bring up all the things someone has done to build a case against them. No, on the contrary, verse six. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Let me say that again, then we'll say it together. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. All right. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. You feel the contrast. We'll say it one more time. Just doesn't rejoice in this, but does rejoice in this. It does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Do you ever rejoice at wrongdoing? I'm guessing most of us, at first glance at least, would say, no, no way. But I want you to think for a moment about someone you really don't like. Maybe somebody you know really well. Maybe somebody you only know from a distance. Maybe somebody in your home or the church. Maybe in your office or maybe the President of the United States, anybody. Or maybe somebody who has deeply offended or hurt you. Are you prone to experience any, any kind of pleasure if that person fails? When that person fails, are you prone to think, oh, it serves them right. And you have this rising up in you a bit of pleasure in their wrongdoing. Or maybe more subtle, are you prone to project or promote a wrongful image of someone else? Love does not rejoice in wrongdoing, but in contrast, rejoices with the truth, like has joy over truth. Oh, so much could be said here in a world where Everybody has, seems to have different perspectives on truth. And it feels so confusing to so many. And I would just encourage us, brothers and sisters, not to take our source of truth as social media or blogs. It's not where we go for truth. It's worthy of joy before God. 
During these days, we've tried to communicate truth amid so much disinformation with no desire or motive before God or before you to lie in any way, yet it sometimes feels futile in days when people are so quick to spread that which is not true or to question that which is. God, help us to take the time, not to stop with what we hear from this or that source, but to actually take the time to seek out that which is true. I think about meetings this week with people who have been willing to take the time to sit together around a table and ask questions about this or that and walk away saying, what's all the fuss then? This is actually really good. Or maybe to get to the end of a conversation and you don't maybe see 100% eye to eye, but you don't walk away questioning or even defaming each other's character. Like truth is worth the time. It is that valuable. And love does it rejoice at wrongdoing. Love takes the time to treasure and rejoice with the truth. All right, look at verses four through six. We're about to say them all together. You see it? You got it hidden in your heart, your mind? Let's try it. Here we go. Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice at wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Well done, well done. And even if you're like struggling a little bit, you're still doing awesome, it's great. Now, here's the last verse, it's four phrases, and almost all the same though except for one word change. So here we go. Let's just read it together. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. You got it? There's four words, really. Bears, believes, hopes, endures. B.B. He, right? (laughs) Just in case you didn't get that. I, I'm guessing you get it. Like B, B, H, E. B, B, E. So let's, let's, let's say it together. Just this verse. We'll just say this verse together. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. You used B, B, E, didn't you? That was helpful. It's helpful. What a, what a picture. Love bears with others. Like if we don't have people in our lives we are bearing with, we are not biblically loving. Believes all things. Believing in each other, believing God for each other. Hoping continually for the best in each other. And enduring through trials together. What a powerful depiction of love. What a word from God to us. And this last verse in particular brings to my mind one of our elder nominees who I have watched along with his wife hurt this week through tears in a deep way as rumors, accusations have been spread and posted online about his credibility to serve as an elder. So I'm gonna ask Ken Tucker and his precious wife, Judy, to join me up here and to share what they have shared with hundreds of people across our church family through our marriage ministry that they lead something we walk through in depth with them as a part of this elder nomination process. 
concerning their journey in the past. And I've asked them to share this, not just so that you can know and rejoice in the truth, but also so that you can see a picture of love that bears all things and believes all things and hopes all things and endures all things. So would you welcome Ken and Judy with me? Good afternoon, church. Today we want to share with you a shortened version of our testimony, which we share regularly at Reengage. This is God's redemptive story in our marriage. One evening decades ago, I was led to Christ by a visiting missionary to the Bahamas. I remember vividly the moment when my sinfulness and lostness became so clear to me that I cried out and asked Jesus to come into my heart and be my savior. I was never quite the same again. For me, accepting Christ in my heart meant that I had secured my place in heaven and all I needed to do was to follow the rules of Christianity. I attended church more often and went to a Bible study because in my mind, these were the rules that were required. You see, I thought I was a good person already. I brought this way of thinking and expectations into my marriage. The early years of our marriage was filled with getting to know one another and having kids. Sadly, for me, it became mostly about getting. I became an insatiable getter, and I was getting anything I put my mind toward. At the same time, resentment towards Judy was beginning to take root. Years passed, and we became, in my opinion, a successful family. I really admired Ken's work ethic and what he was able to achieve. I did my duty as a wife, a mother, and teacher. We really looked the part, but beneath all the success, I was a broken woman, driven by a critical spirit. Things had to be done my way. My way was perfect. Our, ma our marriage deteriorated. Our nominal faith did not equip us to resist the devil. I became the king of resentment. Angry and embittered, I saw Judy as the enemy. This fueled my sin, which led to infidelity in our marriage. We agreed to separate. All that I had worked so hard to control was lost. I was no match for Satan. He had us both right where he wanted us. His ultimate goal was to destroy and he was gaining ground. I realized I was helpless. I needed a greater power. The moment of truth for me came when my counselor said, Judy, God has always been with you. You just haven't yielded to him. For the first time, I realized that I had accepted Christ as my savior, but he hadn't, but he wasn't Lord in my life. I was doing it myself, living the rules of Christianity with selfish motives and self-righteous pride. My family had become my idol. Self-preservation, a critical spirit, and a high sense of responsibility was my, were my strategies of control. But the love of God was missing from my heart. God was not done with us or me yet. While separated from Judy, God continued convicting me and making me uncomfortable. I had no peace. I was unfulfilled, but my heart was hardened. Then something happened that began to change things. Judy's attitude towards me changed and was causing me to wonder if there may be a chance for us. There was a strange but undeniable peace in the house when I visited. I was drawn to it, fully aware that I was not at peace in my own heart. During the separation for the first time, I recognized my own spiritual condition. 
I was broken. I needed Jesus to take control. I needed to trust him. I finally surrendered control to the Lord. It took denying myself, as it says in Matthew 16, 24. It took letting go of everything to find a life in Christ. It took total surrender. What did that mean for me? Here is the answer God gave me early one morning that changed my life forever. It's giving God the steering wheel in my life. His word, the Holy Spirit, and his power, now the driving force, Philippians 4 and 13. It is an awareness of his hand in the choices I make today and every day. It's getting rid of all distractions so I can have time with the Lord. It is allowing him to dwell richly in my mind and purify my thoughts. It's internalizing his words so I may put him into practice. It's trusting him for outcomes, Proverbs 3 and 5. It's loving in unimaginable ways, like being kind to Ken even though he had hurt me so deeply. It's forgiving, like Jesus Christ had forgiven me and in doing so being set free of bitterness and resentment. It's accepting love. It's giving him my negative critical spirit and receiving in exchange the fruit of the spirit, that of love and joy and peace and kindness and gentleness. It is not limiting God. It's the freedom to live fully each day in his presence, doing my duty out of love and service to him. It is surrendering selfishness for un selfishness for selflessness, surrendering my control to his sovereignty for his honor and for his glory in my life. Overnight, I found myself thinking of Judy in kind of gentle ways. The more times I saw her, the more I saw the peace that she had. And the more I heard the voice of God speaking to my heart, his message was clear. I did not need a new marriage. I needed to let God make me a new man. That realization drove me to my knees, and I finally did what Mark 12, 30 commands. I committed to Jesus all my heart, all my soul, all my mind, and all my strength. The next morning, I drove back to my God my wife, my family, and my home. I immediately submitted to weekly accountability and discipleship with a veteran pastor, a Christian counselor, and three Christian brothers who hold me accountable even now on a weekly basis. I gave up years ago my getting ways. I love my wife, Judy. I love my kids, and I love my Lord. All the resentment and rage is gone. I am freed from the master's mastery of sin. I am surrendered to God who is at work in me to will and to do of his good pleasure. Philippians 4 and 13. The events mentioned above happened almost 10 years ago. Today, God is using that experience to equip us in serving others. We celebrate God's amazing love and grace toward us. We keep a zero account when it comes to resentment and negative criticism. We start every morning with prayer and Bible study. It is miraculous what he's done. We want you to know God can do and is willing to do miraculous things in your life and marriage. Romans... <laughs> Romans 8 and 28 is true. All things, every event, he will use for our good, his glory, and his purpose. God bless you.
Praise God, not one of us is chained to our past. And praise God, he is able to redeem the past. For anyone who, who even listening to this uh, has uncovered wounds in your own heart, or maybe brought to the surface struggles you're walking through right now, in your life, your marriage, particularly along those lines, know like Ken and Judy lead this re-engage ministry. And I would highly encourage you, urge you really, to get involved in it and be in a place where people can talk about struggles and wounds honestly and receive grace completely. And, and that's, that's the picture, like, some might ask, well, why, why, didn't, why didn't you share all of this with the church before? And there are many answers to that. When it comes to an elder nominee, Without question, we believe it honors God for a group of members and leaders in this church to fully explore if anything prevents a brother from serving as an elder. But we don't believe it honors God or his grace to then parade out all the failures of that person's past. Based on repentance, approximately 10 years ago, and this brother's evident, blameless love for the Lord, his wife, and for this church over many years. We have said all week long, and it was so encouraging, even just the way you responded in this room. We've said, brother and sister, we are with you, and we are glad to recommend him in this church. And Ken and Judy have not been silent about this. They've shared this honestly with hundreds of people in our church family. And not one of those people who's gotten to know Ken and Judy has raised any concern. This is no secret. But that actually leads to one other thing. Like even if someone in the church did have a concern, a good, valid concern, I truly thought that someone in the church would reach out to us instead of posting and spreading untrue rumors and accusations online. And I guess that's the point. That's what I mean by this larger question beyond the specific question we're asking today. Are these biblically qualified men? That's a really important question. And I would say not just based on 1 Timothy 3 and Titus 1 and Acts 22 about elders, but based on 1 Corinthians chapter 13. We're voting on brothers who love this church and have demonstrated it with their lives. But the bigger question, far beyond this day, is how are we going to love one another in this church? And in the broader church, among Christians and churches, through online attacks and videos and blogs and all sorts of other worldly avenues, are we going to love one another as God is telling us to love one another in the church in a way that is totally counter to the ways of this world? Oh, church, the ways and the tactics of this world are not our ways. Let us be finished and done with them. They only harm the reputation of Jesus. They hurt the bride for which he died, including members of that bride, and they keep us together from the work to which he has called us. It's not who we are. You want to know who we are? Picture all of us locked arms standing together in this city amidst all kinds of needs around us. Five million people in need of the gospel. Many of them, little children, like I was around yesterday, surrounded by so much hurt and pain, and we're working together. We're sweating. We're working with all of our hearts to love God with everything we have and to love others like he has loved us. That's who we are. And... 
And if you are visiting today, especially if you're exploring Christianity, I want to hone in on that last phrase, like God has loved us. I have the greatest news in the world today for you. Though you have sinned against God, as I have, as we all have, and we deserve eternal judgment before God, the greatest news in the world is that God loves you. God, the God who created the world, whom you have sinned against, God is patient toward you. God is kind to you. God so loved you that he gave his one and only son that no matter who you are, no matter what your past has, when you believe in Jesus, he will forgive you of all of your sins and give you eternal life with him. You will never perish but have everlasting life. The God of the universe will keep no record of wrongs for all who trust in his love. I urge you today, trust in his love. And when you do, and for all who have, you are awakened to a whole new way to love that is totally different from the ways of this world. And what does that love look like? Well, let's try to say it together before God. Just do your best. What is God saying to us? Love is patient and kind. Love does not envy or boast. It is not arrogant or rude. It does not insist on its own way. It is not irritable or resentful. It does not rejoice with wrongdoing, but rejoices with the truth. Bring it home. Love bears all things, believes all things, hopes all things, endures all things. the word of God. And, and just in case you want a little extra, the very next verse, first three words. Love never ends. Love like this lasts forever. <laughs>